With digital consoles becoming much more popular in churches, it often adds the option of having an iPad to remote control your soundboard. This video I'm going to tell you why and some other things that you can do with your iPad aside from just controlling your console. Hey, if you're new here, my name is James and I help worship leaders and church sound techs eliminate the mystery and frustration around sound at church. So if you're a worship leader or a sound tech, you found the right place, go ahead and mash that subscribe button. One thing that happens in a lot of churches is that they're designed by somebody that doesn't know anything about sound. And that's okay, we will forgive architects because they went to architecture school, not sound school. So it can be forgivable if they put the sound booth in the back, in the corner in the back, in a balcony, in a closet somewhere, or in a different zip code. Well, maybe not the last few, but often we find that the sound equipment is not in the optimal listening space, right? It can sound very different from where your sound gear is to where most people are sitting and listening. When we have an iPad to remote control our console, we can walk out to where people are actually listening and make changes from there to get a better idea of what it really sounds like for the average person coming to church. If you don't have an iPad and your sound booth is in a suboptimal place, you have to learn the skill of translating. What I mean by translating is hearing something and getting it to intentionally sound bad so that somewhere else it can sound good. Studio mixers have had to do this for a long time when they're mixing in a place that is not exactly optimal for studio mixing. And in live sound, when we have the sound booth in the wrong place, we have to do a lot of walking back and forth to where most people hear it and where we can control it. The problem is your brain is really quick to forget what things sounded like and what changes you might need to make. So it's a skill that has to be developed over time to actually make the changes in one place and listen for them in another place. All of that can be avoided, however, if we set up an app to remote control our console and set it up on a Wi-Fi network. And I'll show you some of those and how to set it all up in just a minute. Now, another place where having remote control of your console with a tablet, and I'm just gonna use iPad from here because most people just use iPads, it's really helpful for monitor mixing. The musicians and singers on stage need to be able to hear themselves, of course, and sometimes the changes that need to be made to their monitor mix happen from the sound Soundboard. Now, other times they have a personal monitor mixer, and that's really helpful because all the controls are right there with them. But other times they have to call out to somebody and say, hey, can I get a little bit less of this and a little bit more of that in their monitor mix? To cut down on a lot of that communication, you can give one or more wireless devices to somebody so that they can make adjustments on their own. Even if you have monitor wedges, it can be really helpful to walk up on stage and hear exactly what the musician or singer is hearing in real time when you're making changes. That's also very helpful if they're hearing something weird and you don't wanna to try to like communicate back and forth what exactly weird means to them. You can just go up on stage and hear it yourself and say, oh yeah, there's like way too much hi-hat in this mix and then you can pull it down easily. If you have a lot of different devices trying to connect to a single mixer, sometimes that can overload its operating system. And I have seen some of them freeze and have to be restarted right in the middle of a rehearsal and that's not a good thing. So be careful and maybe even try to test out how many different devices can connect to a certain console at a time. That way you won't get in a pinch and you'll just know, hey, I know this is our limit. We shouldn't go past that to avoid having to restart the whole thing. And no, I'm not gonna name names for different companies because by the time I publish this, they may have fixed it and there's time in between stuff. So you have to test out your gear in its current condition. I'm not gonna do that for you. Now, a third way that having an iPad for your soundboard is awesome is for a process called line check. Now, if your sound system stays totally plugged in all the time and nothing ever changes, awesome, good for you. I'm really happy for you. But if you ever have to unplug something and plug it back in, you need to test and make sure that it's actually functioning and plugged into the right channel before people come and are expecting to rehearse and sound check. This is where a line check is super helpful. It just makes sure that the line is clean and that it's plugged in in the right place. Because usually there are two, three, maybe even four different places where something can be plugged in in between the input and the soundboard. So if you can test that to make sure that everything's in the right place, it's plugged in and working, 
you're gonna have a much easier sound check if you're not chasing down problems. Usually with a line check, someone will have a microphone and plug it into that mic line and scratch on it. The person at the sound booth can then listen to see if the line is clean and that it's the right channel that they're supposed to be plugged into. Because you're plugging things in and unplugging them during this process, it usually takes two people just to make sure that only one input is unmuted and only when you're testing it. That way you don't get a pop through the system and it damages your speakers or somebody's hearing even. Unless you wanna walk back and forth between the stage and the console the entire afternoon, you should have somebody else there to unmute channels and you're calling back and forth saying, you know, mute bass guitar, so you can unplug the DI and plug that mic into it and scratch on it and say, testing bass guitar. And then the person on the other side says, bass guitar, good. That's all fine and dandy. Then you mute it again, unplug it and move on to the next channel. If you don't have two people, then you're walking back and forth the whole time and that's a big pain. But with the iPad, you can actually just do it right there. So yes, you're carrying around more stuff, but you're not having to walk back and forth, nor are you having to find an extra person to come help you do this process. Now, one of the big problems is how to actually get the iPad to talk to your console. And you have to do it by hooking the console up to a Wi-Fi network. Now, I don't recommend using your public Wi-Fi to connect to the console. The likelihood is very low that some nefarious person could download the right app, get connected to the console and make changes to your board while they're not authorized to do so, but it still is a possibility and you wanna avoid it. More common is that the extra traffic on the Wi-Fi network could make things either sluggish or not work when you're trying to make it work when there's actually people in the room. So if you take your iPad and you walk around the room to make changes from where you can hear better after people are in there, you still want to have a very solid connection. So I recommend getting your own Wi-Fi router that's just for the audio console. They're not that expensive and they're pretty easy to set up. So even somebody that's technically challenged like me can set one up and get it going. You probably can too. Here's a pro tip. Go ahead and get a label maker and put the Wi-Fi router's name and password on it as long as it's kept in the booth and not that public. You still don't want just random people hopping on this network for no reason. Now, full disclosure, I am not a network guru, but I've learned enough to try to make these things work and hopefully get you out of a pinch so that you can get your Wi-Fi router, your console, and your iPad all on the same kind of neighborhood of IP addresses to make it all work. If you think about an IP address as like a physical address that the mailman needs to come and deliver a letter from one person's house to the next person, person's house, you would know that with two different people, if they have the exact same address, the male person isn't going to huh? know what to send where and how to get it there. So all the different devices on your network need to have a unique IP address, but they need to be in the same zip code, right? So some of the numbers have to match and the very last one needs to be different. That's the simple way to think about it. Now the subnet is a group of numbers that tells us how many of these sections of numbers need to match. So if you have 255.255.255.0, that means that the first three sets of numbers need to match and the last one needs to be different. So if it's not on a setting where it changes automatically and it's working for you, you can try to go in there and set it manually and Hopefully that works better. So to check the IP address on your iPad, you need to go to the settings and this might look different on yours because you might have a newer one or a different iOS. I don't know, but for mine, I go to settings and on the Wi-Fi section, I'm gonna hit the little I by that. And then down here, it's gonna talk about the IP address. And this is where you can configure it either automatically or you can try to change it manually if things are not communicating and you need it to work a little bit better than not working. So that's where you can go in and you can change this to be manual. You can type in your own IP address if you wanna do it that way. If automatic is working, then it should connect to your console automatically when you open up the appropriate app. So over here, I've got UC Surface. If I open this up, it's gonna boot up, and this likes to be horizontal. And there I've got my console that I can select. I touch on that one, and now it's gonna communicate with the console, and I can move faders around. I can hear them behind me, I don't know if you can hear them too, but they're moving along with the iPad, and that's super handy. 
Now there are ways in different consoles and different apps to lock out a person to a particular aux send, especially if you're just wanting somebody to have only control over their monitor mix. You can give them a specific login or a password and give them only control over that aux send. And I encourage you figure out your manual, look at other YouTube videos, but that's a little bit beyond the scope of this video today. In an ideal world, everything would just be on automatic mode. This would get assigned that, that would be assigned this, and everything would be hunky-dory, but it doesn't always work that way. And that's when you work on your Google Foo and try to find out all this network stuff. Now, one problem I ran into a few months ago is I was trying to hook up my console to my wireless router, and I did it with a homemade cable. And yes, I was the one that made it, so it's all my fault. But a couple of the pins weren't terminated properly, and although there was some connection between the router and the console, there wasn't enough of a connection for it to assign the IP address automatically. So some communication was going on, but not all the communication was going on. So I had to redo the end of that cable, and it took me a while to do it turned into an all-day affair, but finally, after I got the cable right, everything started setting up automatically and everything got connected much more easily. So it is possible that you might have a bad cable someplace, and that's one thing to look out for. Today's video is sponsored by Attaway Audio Academy and the brand new Audio for Worship Leaders course. Available as a standalone course or as part of our membership site with all of our courses with mixing, broadcast audio, and training new people, Audio for Worship Leaders was made for creative people just like you that don't want to sift through all the technical jargon and look up what terms mean. It's all defined within the course and it's all easy to understand. It'll help you to get consistent results from your team week to week and speed up the process from when something goes wrong to when it's fixed and you can move on to actually having rehearsal. It also includes weekly live Q&A and a course community so you can get help from your peers or from me for something that's bugging you right then when you can't find the answer. With a new lower price, it's a no-brainer to sign up. Find out more through the link down in the description below. When it comes to other things that you can do with an iPad, aside from actually connecting it to your console and using it for remote control or metering or whatever other function you want to have, you can do other fun things as well, like using it as a real-time analyzer. Real-time analyzers take the different frequencies and show their relative level. That can be helpful if you start to have a frequency feeding back and you can look at a screen to see, oh, that's the last frequency that was up high, so I'm guessing that's the one that was feeding back for a minute. Then you can use that information to adjust your EQ to pull that frequency down and get less feedback in the future. The built-in microphone works okay for this, but I wouldn't make any mixing decisions based on what the RTA looks like, but it will identify a feedback frequency or something that might be out of place where you identify it with your ears and then see it on the screen at the same time. That could be helpful. Although I've noticed that in the lower frequency range, it's just not all that accurate at all. It is possible to get an audio interface that can go into your iPad and then you can actually use a real microphone or a reference microphone that's got a pretty flat response and maybe even needs phantom power, and then you can use your iPad a little bit more clearly with your real-time analyzer. It's just giving it better data if you've got a better microphone plugged into it. Sonic Tools is one app that I checked out, and it's got a lot of great ratings on the App Store. When I open up Sonic Tools, I get this, and it'll show me both the peak of what's been there or historically in the green behind it and then the red are what's going on right now. So that can be helpful if you had a feedback frequency like you can see that one stuck up a whole lot. The problem is I don't know how exactly to change the reference point or how high this is going, even in the settings. Maybe I can turn my mic gain down a little bit. Yeah, there we go. That works for turning that down, but I also don't know how to clear the history yet either. And these Hamming, Hanning, and Blackman, don't know what that is. I'll have to research and let you know, or if you know, let me know in the comments down below. And turn off peak hold, there we go. Turn off peak hold and turn it back on again, and you get it. It says FFT, or you can do RTA. I'm not really sure that FFT is actually two channel measurement, but I could be wrong. The other setting that I might suggest you try is spectrogram. And depending on the speed of this, that can tell you certain things. Sometimes with the spectrogram, when you have a feedback frequency that's kind of like in the background and like ringing, but not like out in front ringing, uh, you can identify it with the spectrogram because you'll see a solid line there over time. So if we have... You can see that right here that line is a little bit more than it was there. And 
you know, then you can say, aha, that might be that frequency. So I know that that's right around 270, maybe 300. I must have gotten middle C pretty close. Those are things you can do for that. Changing the different things that you have is fun. This one's a little bit more, you know, precise, but it also can show things, you know, like too much information. You might want to take it down to like an RTA on one twelfth of an octave. That might be a little bit more easily definable. Or that data might be a little bit easier for you to read in the context of everything. It's helpful though if you can kind of drag your finger over a certain frequency and see what it is. I think it's telling me right here the top they're the highest level frequency right there. So if I go, okay, so that's 431. That's just telling me, hey, that's that. There's other things here. I don't know how useful they are, but your mileage may vary. You can experiment with that on your own. Decibel X is another pretty cool one. And it's got a bunch of different views you can use. And some of them are useful and some of them, I don't see much use for them at all, but it's kind of fun to look at. And if you can calibrate it to be an actual SPL meter, that could be a lot of fun to see your big SPL there and the real time analyzer as well. I'm not gonna try the premium membership. And this is kind of the view that I kind of like. Uh, if you can get it calibrated well to an actual SPL meter, then you can see it on the screen and you can see the bouncing lines as well. I thought this was a pretty cool view. There's other ones you can use. You know, you can change all of this stuff. You can do even one sixth of an octave. So you can do that. Let's see, play it again. So this is a pretty cool way to see it. It might be a little bit more fun to have kind of like the dance vibe. You know, you can see the kick and the snare hitting. That can be pretty cool too. Uh, there's a lot more settings in all of these that I can even go into, but they're handy tools and they're just good to have around. And you know, it doesn't hurt that you get some style points too. Now, some of these mislabel their real-time analyzer as an FFT or fast Fourier transform, but an FFT actually requires two measurements to compare one another, whereas a real-time analyzer just has one measurement to compare. Most of the time when we're mixing, we don't actually need two different signals to compare, but that's another topic for another day. There are a gazillion other RTA and spectrum analyzer apps out there, and I didn't have time to review them all or even include them in this video, but if you want to let me know your favorite one, go ahead and type those down in the comments below. I would be grateful for your input on that. The other thing is if you're doing vocal tuning and you're not exactly sure what key it is, if you can pick it out with the piano, that can help you. Like if you can find the root of the song, like if you have enough musical ear training, you can kind of tap it out. And... Okay, now I know that we're in the key of C and we can move it over with that. So any free piano app or some sort of thing that can help you figure out what key something is in, or you could use a tuner and if you can just hum the root note, the doo, you can figure out, okay, that's where we're at. Those can be handy tools to have right at front of house too. Or you could use your phone for the same thing. It doesn't have to be an iPad. So when it comes to which iPad you should actually buy, there's kind of two different conflicting ideas here. The first is that you don't want to spend too much money and get a Ferrari kind of iPad for something that's just like driving back and forth to the grocery store, right? It's not that you were using a whole lot of power to remote control to a console. It's basically a big multi-touch mouse. On the flip side, I'm a big fan of buy once, cry once, and you can actually buy stuff that's so old that it's obsolete and won't work with the latest update or the latest software revision, and then you have a big paperweight, and that wasn't a good use of your money. I have to admit there is some value in having more screen size. So if you've got a lot of faders you're trying to juggle at once, a bigger screen can be helpful. And if you're dragging your finger around on an equalizer, having a little bit more real estate can help you to fine tune things a little bit better. Although if you are on staff at a church and there are other things that you could use the iPad for during the week, it might be a good idea to get a higher powered iPad to do those things. And then it doubles as this is our iPad for the sound booth, just as long as it actually makes it there. So which iPad did I buy for me? Well, I am a budget-minded person, and so I got a 2018 refurbished iPad off of Amazon. No, it doesn't have the fancy bells and whistles, but it came in at under $200, including the case, so it's kind of hard to go wrong with that. I actually like to take a lot of handwritten notes, but I don't like to keep them organized, like I've got a big stack of spiral notebooks someplace that have notes strewn about with all different kinds of topics. So I've actually enjoyed getting a knockoff Apple Pencil and taking notes on the iPad so that it helps me do the handwriting thing and keep all my files organized at the same time. So that's one thing that I've considered is upgrading to a bigger iPad for that. But for right now, this 2018, you know, 
nine whatever inch iPad is working great and I don't see it going obsolete anytime soon. However, if you see a 12.9 inch iPad Pro here in the future, you'll know why. It's because I love drawing and taking notes and making graphics for you guys. So that's the basics of how I use an iPad, but I wanna hear from you. Put down in the comments how you like to use it, how it's changed how you mix, or even changed your workflow as a church with monitor mixes. I'd love to hear all about it. If you liked this video, go ahead and mash that thumbs up. Hit subscribe if you're a sound tech or a worship leader, and we'll see you back here next time on Attaway Audio.